since we finally get to some scripture here, we can talk about scripture. Imagine that in a Christian magazine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, scripture? Really? We- Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. This is a show about guns, hunting, competition, and the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode 81, brought to you by Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, cooksholsters.com. I got to tell you, I am really excited about today's show. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. I've got another church shooting club outing this weekend, and in celebration of National Shooting Sports Month, I'll be introducing all my friends at church to different types of competitive shooting. I've got some Steel Challenge stages, IDPA, GSSF, USPSA, i I'm going to give the group a taste of lots of different kinds of action pistol sports, and um, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'll have more about that next week. What's got me excited, especially excited about today's show, is our special guest. I'm a big fan of the action spy thriller genre of books. I love the Jack Ryan series from Tom Clancy. I got hooked on uh, Vince Flynn's Mitch Rapp series when I was on vacation in Florida some years ago. Uh, we had stopped on a just a, at a Walmart to grab some supplies and. I figured I'd pick up something fun to read uh, while I was sitting on the beach and got hooked on Vince Flynn. And uh, recently, it's been the Scott Harvath series of books from Brad Thor. And then a couple of months ago, I stumbled upon Ray Keating's works on Amazon.com. The main character, Stephen Grant, is a former Navy SEAL, a former CIA assassin, who leaves that life behind to go into the ministry. And he becomes an LCMS Lutheran pastor. But his old life collides with the new one, creating an exciting series of adventures for the pistol packing pastor at St. Mary's Lutheran Church on Long Island. It's a great mix of theology, politics, intrigue, terrorism, gunplay. I think you'll love it. I love it. So sit back and relax. Enjoy the show. We get started next, right after this. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio on the Self-Defense Radio Network. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. With those words, our founding fathers changed the world. They launched an experiment in freedom, where common lawful citizens are free to speak and gather and worship as they choose. But first among those freedoms is the one freedom that makes the rest possible. For 130 years, we've worked to preserve freedom first. I'm Wayne LaPierre of the National Rifle Association. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Before we get to our special guest interview today, let me give you a little taste of our guest's work. This is from Chapter 5 of his first book, Warrior Monk. Linda Serrano burst into the church. No one was standing inside the doors. The choir still sang. Apparently, they didn't hear the gunshot. Perfect, she whispered. She took one of the staircases to the choir loft, two steps at a time. At the top, Linda came around the corner and saw the backs of the people singing quite loudly as the organ played. A couple of heads briefly glanced her way, but no one spotted the gun hanging down at Serrano's side in her right hand. Below, Grant looked through the glass window in the door leading back into the narthex. Seeing no one, he quickly moved through it. He scanned the area and peeked into the nave. Conveniently for Serrano, 
Flo Gunderson stood not more than five feet away in the last row. Linda moved towards her, keeping the Beretta at her side. Flo actually glanced and smiled at Serrano before turning her attention back to Scott. Serrano quickly raised the gun and deposited a bullet through Mrs. Gunderson's back. It ripped through her heart. All hell broke loose in the choir loft after the shot rang out. Flo Gunderson crumpled forward onto fellow choir members and then onto the floor. She was dead before her body came to a complete rest. Half the group screamed, others dove for cover, a few stood immobilized. Amidst the chaos, Scott Larson tried to make his way to the shooter. The former high school sports star was not quick enough, though, as Serrano landed a slug just below his left shoulder and then a second into his back as his body turned. At the sound of the first shot, Grant turned and sped for the stairs. With the second and third, he paused briefly at the top. He looked around the corner and tried to assess the situation. Grant had to stop the woman who was shooting his parishioners. As he emerged, Linda Serrano first noted Grant's gun and grabbed the person to her left and stuck the Beretta in the woman's neck. Then Serrano saw the collar. You're the one I'm looking for, pastor, she hissed. Grant counted two down and saw the shooter pointing a twenty two caliber into the neck of Jennifer Breeze, longtime member of the congregation and wife of Congressman Ted Breeze. Of course, grab the congressman's wife. Grant could see panic bubbling up in Serrano. As cries and movement among the choir members distracted her, she screamed, Get back! Get back! Get away! Nobody move! She focused on Grant. What's with the gun, Pastor? Grant tried to sound soothing. Let's take it easy. There's no reason for anyone else to get hurt. Why not put the gun down and we'll end all of this? Serrano shot back. Shut up! I'm getting the hell out of here. She started frantically looking for a way to get out while ordering, Drop the gun! Grant ignored the demand. Meanwhile, Pam Carter started slowly crawling out from behind the organ toward her fiancé, who was sprawled on the tiled choir loft floor in a slowly expanding pool of blood. Linda Serrano shouted at her, Get back where you were! But Grant saw that Pam could not or would not heed the warnings. She was completely immersed in her need to get to her husband-to-be. While keeping his gun trained on the shooter, Grant said, It's okay. Just let her go to him. Cries continued all around. No, I said no, Serrano shouted. She took the gun away from Jennifer's neck in a move toward Pam. In that instant, Grant prayed silently. God help me. He fired a single shot into the forehead of Linda Serrano, who fell back over the choir loft's low railing. If the bullet didn't kill her immediately, the point of one of the pews now protruding through her abdomen finished the job. Serrano's eyes were wide open, vacant, and lifeless. The next line of the hymn came into Grant's head as he looked down from the choir loft. One little word can fell him. The incident was over in a few minutes, but a great deal was set in motion. Until that moment, Stephen Grant seemed to have existed in two completely separate universes. First was as a Navy SEAL, followed by time as an analyst, unofficially as an assassin with the CIA. After a break, the second was studying to become and then serving as a Lutheran pastor. In a matter of mere minutes, the two worlds merged in a flurry of bullets, blood, song, and prayer. Author Ray Keating joins me right here on Armed Lutheran Radio right after this. Having a good holster is absolutely critical if you're going to carry a firearm for self-defense. If you need a quality holster, let me recommend Cook's Holsters. I've found Cook's Holsters in the pre-podcast days when I bought a Cook's IWB holster to write a review. And I did a lot of, of Kydex holster reviews back in those in those uh, blogging days. But I like that holster from Cook's Holsters so much that I applied to become an official Cook's Holsters dealer. Cook's Holsters are American made in the great state of Georgia. They are custom molded to fit your firearm. The advantage of Kydex over other materials is that it holds its shape. It doesn't stretch. Um, It doesn't lose retention. It won't wear on the finish of your firearm 
the Way Leather Wheel, for example. They're available for hundreds of gun models. They're in dozens of color combinations and different printed patterns and, and camouflage. They're great for concealed carry, for range work, for competition. They come with a lifetime warranty against defects and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Check them out today, www.cooksholsters.com or visit the Armed Lutheran shop at armedlutheran.us slash shop. Use the promo code armedpodcast to save 10% off of your order and make sure you've got a quality holster and don't settle for anything less. Go to cooksholsters.com today. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Our special guest today is an economist, a columnist with RealClearMarkets.com. He's the former weekly columnist with Long Island Business News and Newsday. He's a, a former college professor, and his works appeared in places like the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, National Review. And you're probably wondering at this point what all this has to do with guns and God and Lutheranism. Well, it just so happens that our guest is also an author of six works of fiction, a series of action thrillers with a very unlikely hero, a Lutheran pastor named Stephen Grant. Ray Keating, welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Thanks very much, Lloyd. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for being here. First, I I just got to tell you, I'm a big fan of this genre of books. I'm a fan of you know, Clancy and um, Vince Flynn's Mitch Rapp series, and of course, Brad Thor. And the Pastor Stephen Grant series, I really think, ranks among those in my, uh, among my favorite books. But how did you get the idea to start writing a series of action thrillers? Well, uh, first, thank you very much for the, for the nice comments. And uh, the Tom Clancy one means a lot because that's, Kind of where I dipped my toe into thrillers was with Tom Clancy. To, so that's that's very nice of you to say. Um, you're right. I'm an economist by trade. Uh, I've also been uh, a newspaper columnist, now online columnist, for more than 20 years. And I think every newspaper columnist believes they have a book in them, you know. And uh, I did uh, – I've done policy books and, uh, you know, my first – Three books all had by the numbers in the title, so I promised my wife that someday I would write a book that actually had words in it. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, how this all came about was a uh, person I work with, I've worked with her for many years, mentioned to me uh, one day that just in passing, you know, we were having a conversation, and she said, oh, I, there's a new priest in my, in my, uh, at my parish, and he used to be with the CIA. So I was uh-huh. like, well, that's really neat. So I kind of filed that away. Uh, said, you know, if I ever write my novel, maybe I'll play around with that. And then um, <clears throat> you mentioned I was a, a columnist with Newsday on Long Island here. So I wrote a weekly column there for about 12 years. And uh, lo and behold, at Hofstra University on Long Island, they were going to have a James Bond conference. Ooh. So uh, I said to my <laughs> editor, well, I have to go to the James Bond conference. And he said, sure, right, that sounds good. <laughs> uh, off I went, and I found out that Ian Fleming... Uh, was my age at the time when his first James Bond novel came out. Oh, so that was kind of the impetus. I, uh, I finished... all the stars aligned at that point. That's right. <laughs> I uh, I finished the column, sent it in, and then I uh, I uh, decided to get started on uh, on this this these books. And and uh, you know I wrote Warrior Monk was the first one, uh, and I did not you know have a think it was going to be a series going in. Uh, but uh, it's turned out to be a wonderful journey, and it's very different from, you know, my, my if you will, my full-time job of being an economist, uh, chief economist with a small business group for over 20 years. So there I do, you know, a lot of policy analysis and writing on the economy. Um, and then, you know, as I said, I've been a newspaper slash online columnist for many years. Writing a novel is completely different. It's just, uh, to be honest with you, it's just a heck of a lot of fun. It's like taking a little vacation whenever, whenever I can, <laughs> you know, carve out the time to work on it. So it's been great. Let's talk about Stephen Grant. I mean, you you gave us the idea or, or an, uh, an idea of where you got the idea for the character. He's really un- an unusual hero. So tell people a little bit about this guy. Sure, he's um, he's a he was a Navy SEAL. And then he went on to the CIA. Uh, he used his skills, as I say in the books, various times. You know, he, he at various times he had a uh, 
a cubicle at the CIA at Langley, but he wasn't there very often because he was right. out in the field doing things. Analyst um, in quotes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> uh, some people have referred to him as a CIA assassin. And then we have – we pick up his life uh, years later uh, after he becomes a Lutheran pastor um, on Long Island. And, uh, you know, at various times in the books, I, I give a little bit here and there about, you know, his uh, his moving from, you know, one life to the other. A big part of the, the books is that, you know, he thought he left that old life behind, but right. uh, in Warrior Monk, it revisits, and then uh, we get to see uh, it revisited uh, in different ways in, in the following novels. But um, yeah, he's, it, he's, I, I've often told people when I, you know, when they say, give me one line as to what this is, it's like, well, think of James Bond as your priest or pastor or something like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, so it's, it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's enjoyable to write because I, you know, I'm, I'm telling a thriller, uh, you know, adventure, you know, murder, guns, all sorts of things. I work in, uh, some theology here and there, and hopefully not in a hitch over the head kind of way. Um, and I, I work hard to kind of make, uh, you know, the dialogue natural. Uh, and hopefully the characters, you know, I know when I pick up a book, watch a movie, television show, uh, I want to like the characters on some level. I mean, there are, you know, a few examples, I suppose, of Things that, you know, like The Godfather, I suppose, you know, I've watched The Godfather and like anybody, but I still watched it. Right. But uh, but you want to I, I like it when you have uh, characters that you can uh, enjoy on, on various levels. So it, the characters have been great dreaming them up, uh, their various interests, uh, obviously the relationship between all of them uh, and just bringing those, you know, that CIA life primarily uh, into his his current life as a pastor. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, as long as somebody out there continues to enjoy reading it, then I'll keep writing it because it's just a heck of a lot of fun. What is your what is your association with Lutheranism? Because you get the doctrinal and the liturgical stuff absolutely right in these books. And I saw at the end of, I guess it was Murderer's Row, where you gave some credit to uh, someone for kind of helping you with the theological stuff, but from the hymns to the, the prayers and Grant's sermons and the way he explains the Lutheran confessions to non-Lutheran friends, it's it's really remarkable, and, the, and the, the way you weave it into the story in a very natural way. Well, I appreciate that, and, and weaving it in in a natural way is, is really critical to me, but uh, my own background, I'm, I'm a LCMS, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Lutheran. Is that repetitive? I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, actually, I grew up Roman Catholic uh, and, and wound up uh, in my young days, in the early 20s, becoming uh, a Lutheran. And I've been very fortunate on that front to have some wonderful pastors that have just you know helped guide me along the way, teach me, and so on. Um, and then also, I've been very active in the church uh, in terms of church council and uh, district conventions, and I went to the 2010 Lutheran Church Missouri Synod National Convention. So I've always been very active um, in the church as best I can, given everything else going on in life. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, my son, actually, my oldest son, is is studying to become a, an LCMS pastor. So it's very uh, it's very rich in our you know it's very much in our lives uh, in a very real and substantive way. So um, so hopefully that. The, the key with that, you know, I mean, some, sometimes when you get into the Christian fiction genre, um, you know, sometimes the theology, quite frankly, sometimes gets a little dicey <laughs> at right. times. But also, I, I find there's a, and not with all of them, there are some wonderful writers, but there tends to be, a, you know, some wooden characters, stilted dialogue, mm -hmm. and I, I try to... Not make that mistake. I mean, not to say that I, you know, don't slip into all sorts of problems, and obviously, uh, you do the best you can. But, um, but I try to be cognizant of of those issues. Um, and then, you know, the other the other issue here is uh, when I was writing for Newsday in particular, uh, I was I had great freedom in whatever I wanted to write on each week, as long as it's somehow or another I could tie it back to Long Island. I could write about it. <laughs> so I it was very interesting because I, I wrote on religious issues a lot. Um, and I was able to interview a whole host of pastors and priests and get to know them, I think, in a, in a, in a, at a different level 
um, you know, sit down in a diner with them and chat about things. And so in addition to my LCMS uh, pastors, if you will, Mm -hmm. I was able to talk to a whole host of other uh, pastors and priests and so on and and really get some uh, interesting takes. And, you know, one of the things that in uh, in the books, um, Stephen Grant's two closest friends these days are one is a Catholic priest and one is an Anglican priest. Um, and I did that on purpose for a variety of reasons, but, but, you know, there is this, um, you know, we all know the challenge in the culture right now, and there is something to be said, uh, where we can work together in the public arena, um, you know, in terms of traditional Christians across denominations, um, that that's a good thing. And, and these guys are interesting. They're, they're ecumenical, but not in that kind of. A stale way that you think about it, where everybody just gives up on all their beliefs and just you know it's a big hug. Right. Um, they, they have their differences; they know that, uh, but they're also very good friends, and they meet on a regular basis, and and they do devotional reading, and then they kind of hash out a whole host of things and and just enjoy each other's company. So uh, uh, that I'm, came that came from my experience as a as a newspaper columnist. We'll be back with more of this special guest interview right after this short timeout, right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. As many of you know, Sergeant Bill and I are competitive shooters. We're also reloaders. Bill helped me to get started last year, but I've still got a lot to learn. One thing I do know, though, you need a good source for supplies and components. So let me tell you about U.S. Reloading Supply. Yeah, there are bigger suppliers out there, but what sets U.S. Reloading Supply apart from the rest is their dedication to customer satisfaction. Check them out at usreloadingsupply.com. They carry the top name brands like Starline, Rainier, Berries, Remington, Spear, and Hornaday. If you've got a special order like primers and powder that you don't see on their website, give them a call for a quote. I did and got a great price. Excellent customer service, fast delivery, prices that include shipping, and a promise to match or beat any retailer's price, including shipping. Call them today, 941-451-7357, or visit them today at usreloadingsupply.com and use the promo code LUTHERAN2017 to save 10% off your order. Order, usreloadingsupply.com. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. We now continue with our special guest interview with author Ray Keating. The interaction between those three characters, Grant and the, and the two other priests, is it's phenomenal. It's 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 really fun to the way they pick at each other and the way they talk to each other and and there ne- there's never any animosity about their difference of, of belief. It's just it's tremendous, and it feels so natural. These three friends sitting down talking or getting together for dinner or having a barbecue or or sitting down like you said at a diner and and going through devotions and eating eating breakfast. Grant is the pastor of an LCMS church, uh, St. Mary's Lutheran Church in Manorville. Does St. Mary's exist? Do, uh, do, do these do these fictional places have a basis in some place that you've been or some some real some real place? Yes, and, and again, I think the St. Mary's. And I've had questions about people. Why? What's the name of the St. Mary's Lutheran Church? You know, and some people are very outraged by it, and other people are like, oh, you know. So there actually, I believe, are one or two St. Mary's Lutheran churches in America. Uh-huh. Um, but I kind of did that with. It was kind of like that little part of me, my personality, where it's like, <laughs> you know, certain Lutherans just don't know what to do with Mary, so let's make it St. Mary's Lutheran Church. <laughs> so that's kind of that little side of my personality, I guess. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, for example, the uh, the Anglican Church, uh, mm-hmm. Father Tom Stone, uh, he moved his his church out of, and and I don't want. Uh, listeners to get the idea that this is what this is all about. This is kind of the stuff that I work in to tell you who these people are Mm -hmm. and hopefully make them interesting and so on. But he moved his church out of the Episcopal Church, his parish, uh, for a whole host of reasons in terms of where the Episcopal Church went and and went into the Anglican Church in North America. Now, I actually met a couple of um, Anglican priests that did that in the New York area. And quite frankly, in New York, that's pretty rare. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, putting New York in perspective on the grand, you know, scheme of <laughs> philosophy and outlook. But there have been a couple, and, and I met them, actually three of them. And um, uh, so that kind of gave me, 
you know, a, a little uh, background in terms of doing that. Um, so it's a lot of this is, you know, like any writer, I think, you know, you pick and choose, you know, your experiences and then mm-hmm. other stuff is just, you know, fun to make up. Um, and uh, but, yeah, the, I, I think those those characters come out of that experience that I had, as I said, with uh, with writing that newspaper column and being able to fortunate enough to write on on Christian slash religious issues on a regular basis. So. so in each of your books has not only a tense and exciting plot, as you would expect from from an action thriller with lots of twists and action and violence and sex and betrayal and all the stuff that makes these novels great, but you also build around broader cultural themes that that the church and society um, are dealing with today. One of the reviews on the cover of your book says, you know, these, these stories could be ripped from today's headlines. You know, you're talking about greed and mega churches and government spending and and uh, eminent domain, religious freedom and and all these things and and lots of of course a lot lots of the bad guys are are happen to be liberals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? And, yeah. Uh, you know, I compared your your books to to Thor and Flynn and 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 Clancy, but unlike those authors, you're making conservative arguments and you're making cultural uh, observations that they typically don't do talking about real issues in some cases central to the plot in others uh sort of tangential right but you but you do it in such a way that it feels perfectly natural you learn something and you don't like, uh, for example, one of the things that I found really fascinating was this, uh, I'm going to talk about this character in a minute, is is Pastor Grant's wife. But the, you have these um, situations where, for example, she's an economist. She goes and she speaks before Congress, and there's an interview that she does on the radio in Long Island. And, and there, there are other places, like the, the sermons, for example, that Pastor Grant uh, gives, where instead of just saying... And he gave a, a stirring uh, homily. You actually spell it out. You actually provide those prayers and those those sermons and the interviews, and you're, you're they're filled with facts and they're filled with excellent uh, lessons about Lutheran theology, about Christianity, about life that a lot of those other authors don't give you the that kind of context. You get to know these characters and know who they are and how they tick, and you get to you you sort of you start to care about them in a way that you don't do with the characters in these other in these other thrillers. Well, again, I, I appreciate that, and I hope that's that is what I'm trying to do. And and you know, I'm trying to. It's always you always have to be careful with when you're writing a book like this. You know, what's your you know I want to, first off I want to tell a, a hopefully a fun story, an interesting story. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to bring some some characters, as I said, to the table that people will care about or be interested in. You know, you can hate the bad guys, certainly. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yes, and then say some things along the way. And that's what you're talking about. And it's, you know, you always have to be careful. How far do you go? How do you say it? So I, it's always that challenge to how, how are you going to do it without, you know, hitting people over the head with a two by four. So <laughs> right. that's that's the that's the thing. And, you know, I've gotten I've had there was one I think it was on Goodreads. Somebody wrote a review, and I just love it because it was a guy that clearly does not align with any of the views put forth by Stephen Grant or his <laughs> his friends. And he's and he wrote, "I should hate this, but I love it, and I keep reading it." So I was like, "That's wonderful." That was, to me was one of the best reviews I ever got. So that was right. that was fun to read something like that. Uh, and and you know, again, it's I under listen. I I understand. There's a temptation, right? I mean, I I like. Tom Clancy and Brad Thor and Vince Flynn and all those guys, mm-hmm. you know, but you know, people have said to me, well, do you ever think about going down that path? I said, well, sure. I've thought about it and who knows, maybe I'll, you know, something totally different, you know, if I have the opportunity one day, but really I, I came to this doing this for a reason that I, that I, you know, to get across a variety of ideas and quite frankly, just to get across the idea that, you know, Hey, look, here we are. Uh, Christians, you know, it, it, it's almost like what I think um, movies and things used to be a long time ago, where it was just kind of, hey, look, you know, here are Christians and they're good folks and they're your neighbors and you know, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, 
and you know as opposed to some of the stuff that we get fed today so you know I, the, the purpose is there to to make I and mean, listen I, I made him a Lutheran pastor for a reason mm-hmm. um, and hopefully you know people can can take something away from it uh, whether it's just I enjoyed those novels or or listen you know there's some interesting points raised here and maybe I can you know think about it a little bit more I think that's what I like so much about this. You you have actually the, the the main characters in these books are normal, wholesome people. Your your hero is not sort of this broken, conflicted sort of you know the kind of people you find in some of these other books and movies. He's truly a good person, but at the same time, he deals with the kinds of struggles and anxieties that everybody does, even as a pastor. And and I think that's what makes the character so endearing. I was actually tearing up uh, in the middle of Murderer's Row as as characters were getting whacked. That was that was a hard book to read, and and there's a tremendous scene I wanted to ask you about that's in the river. That's your f- the fourth book. Mm-hmm. Is that right? It's almost a. Uh, uh, sort of an image of of Christ kind of scene where you've got Pastor Grant and he's teamed up with some of his former CIA friends to find a bad guy. And I'm not going to give away any of the plot here, but this person has done something really bad. He's caught up with the bad guy and he is struggling with that desire to exact revenge. Right. To pull the trigger and someone else does it for him. And then he deals, the rest of that book, he is torn dealing with the guilt that someone else took that that burden off of him. It's really an amazing scene and an amazing, the way you wrote that, it, I, that is, I just, I loved it. It was, it was fantastic. And it, and it really moved me um, in a way that I don't, I, none of those other authors has ever been able to do. Well, I appreciate that. That's I mean, you summed it up. That's what I was trying to do, and the fact that it came through is 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 great. Um, and that's something actually that I that struggle. I, I mention it not in a big way, but in in uh, in passing or in a couple of pages in the, the the next book that's coming out because that's something that you know it's one of those things that we all struggle with, right? We're saints and sinners, right. and we and he as a pastor knows he's forgiven but there's still something there because the you know it's it's a struggle for him because he is sorry but he he knows that he's like well if i was put in that situation again with those exact same circumstances mm-hmm. what would i do and those are things that we all struggle with and it, you know obviously at various levels but you know that with with Stephen Grant in particular because He's really the only character, with a few exceptions here and there, where I go inside his head, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, his thoughts, and um, and you know, I listen. I grew up, as I said, Roman Catholic, and and you know, I don't hate the Catholic Church today in any way, shape, or form. It's just that it made sense to me to go where I am now. Right. But um, but growing up, there was always this. The priest was like, you know, oh, you know, there was, the priest <laughs> right. was super holy, you know, and that type of thing. Um, <laughs> And that's not, you know, the reality of life. And I think if probably, you, you, obviously, if you talk to most priests today, they'll tell you that's not the reality. <laughs> but that was what we were taught or the perception or however you want to put it. But I wanted to, you know, get across the point that, yeah, the pastor struggles with this just like the rest of us. And that's been, you know, some of the best sermons I've ever heard. And most are those sermons where, you know, the pastor makes that clear. It's like, hey, I'm right in the trenches there with you struggling with these things. So, yep. We'll be back with more of this special guest interview right after this short break. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio on the Self-Defense Radio Network. The percentage of women who own guns is growing. American women are more knowledgeable and better equipped to defend themselves than ever before. So why is it that every time I go to a gun shop, I feel like they're talking down to me? Like, hey, little lady, let me show you what you need. It's like all they want to do is sell me a pink gun. If you're tired of feeling that too, visit Guns for Gals, a specialty firearms boutique designed to empower women with information about firearm safety and to equip them with the means to protect themselves. The owners go out of their way to find products specifically for women, and they actually listen and ask questions to help you find the right products to meet your needs. 
If they wouldn't own it themselves, they won't sell it. Guns for Gals is located at 2035 Central Circle, Suite 108 in McKinney, Texas. Open Monday 1 to 6 and Tuesday through Thursday 11 to 7. And on weekends, you can find them at a gun show near you. Or shop online at www.gunsforgals.com. Guns for Gals, more than just a gun shop. It's how gun shopping should be. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. We now continue with our special guest interview with author Ray Keating. Uh, for those who think, you know, we've talked about, it, you know, the pastor's a main character. This, this, oh, this just can't be. This can't be good. The, the language in the books, the violence, the sex, it's not gratuitous. It's all very realistic. There's a there's adultery. There's drug use. There's murder. There's terrorism. Torture. And the language is not sanitized. It's all real life. Yeah, I get in trouble sometimes for, for that. <laughs> I start to say, <laughs> is there a conscious effort to, to – there's a fine line there where you're trying to – I don't want to make it too gratuitous, but I don't want it to be, you know, too goody-goody. Right, and that's 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 the struggle. You you nailed it. It's um, of all you know. We all struggle with many things, and I know, especially when I'm tired or aggravated and so on. One of the things I struggle with is language, quite frankly. Um, so that's you know. So I think that's part of life. Now, maybe that's just me being a New Yorker. I don't know. There's so much of it around. But yeah, so it's the balance, right? You don't want to go. You certainly don't want to go into the gratuitous area with any of this, and I hope. Uh, any of the the violence, uh, the language, it, it's there for a purpose. It's not just, I, I don't believe in the idea of, oh, well, you know, it's like once the, the Hayes Code went away in Hollywood, they were like, well, let's <laughs> just have fun and do whatever we want. And let's see how we can shock people, you know? Right, and that's bomb every yeah, other word. Right, exactly. Now, that, <laughs> now but still, I, I do sprinkle those things in there in an attempt to make it seem more real life that this is how right. these people act and i'll tell you i get i <laughs> i get people and i know listen i know i'm gonna get it most people i kind of appreciate it but there are a few people that are like oh you know it's you know can't read this because of the bad language i'm like okay well you know huh? sorry I, I guess that's all i could say <laughs> you know? but there, there are other things I'm, I'm an economist there are other things out there in the marketplace so you can find something else <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, one of the the fun interactions, the, the, the character interactions, is his interaction with his former partner and, as it turns out, former lover, uh, Paige Caldwell, who was with him in the in the CIA. Right, and she she doesn't really get his his new vocation, does does she? <laughs> she does not. She she doesn't. She doesn't. You know, there are various times where, along the way, you know, she, it, for the most part, she doesn't. And you see that in Warrior Monk, the first book. Mm -hmm. But there are little moments where Paige Caldwell, you know, does something. And Stephen's even a little surprised by it. He knows her so well. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, she, she's a she's a fun character to write. <laughs> um, she just really is. Actually, it's funny. When the book first came out, my oldest son was in high school. And one of his friends read it when Warrior Monk came out. And uh, <laughs> his comment was... And this, keep in mind, this is a high school kid. He goes, that Paige Caldwell, she's a floozy. And I was like, did he really use the word floozy? <laughs> it's like, what year is this? Um, but she, she's, she's great fun. And, and she, they, they know each other very well. It, it sets up an interesting dynamic in terms of, you know, they have this relationship. She comes back into his life because of the CIA and a whole host of reasons. And there's a, there's a new relationship. It's a different, it's a completely different relationship. You know, it's platonic. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we we're into book six. So, you know, Stephen Grant gets married in one of the books. And right. um, so th there is still that little, you know, when you go to Stephen's mind, there there are moments where his wife is together with Paige Caldwell. And he's like, this is weird. You know, I'm not <laughs> right. really comfortable with this. <laughs> but they understand, I think, what their relationship is now. And it's very much, you know, he still trusts her. And she trusts him because of what they went through in terms of, you know, things at the CIA and basically having each other's back and so on. Um, and she does some, you know, uh, things that perhaps, you know, when you first meet, meet Paige Caldwell later on, you, you wouldn't expect it. But it's and, I'm, and, and there's some from book to book, there's some development going on with her as well. Um, she's not in, you know, book six and forthcoming book seven, the same exact person. As she was in the first one, so right. 
So there's <clears throat> there's also a a lot of gunplay in these books, and Pastor Grant has a gun safe in his office at his church, which I found was I found yes. interesting. And his his of course his excuse was that. Um, you know, having them close by so that he doesn't have to run back to the house to get his guns to go to the range. But it comes in handy in the first book. He keeps, what is it, a 10 millimeter Glock 20, right. a Harris M89 sniper rifle, which I found quite interesting. But the the one that I really was puzzled by was the, the Taurus PT-25. That one surprised me. For I mean, it's a deep cover gun, obviously. It's very right. small. Right. Why Taurus as opposed to the Beretta versions? Oh, my goodness. Well, see, this has been a learning process for me. This is the research area. I, you know, first of all, I'll give you a little background. I mean, for, you know, I have, um, you know, I'm an NRA member. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I've written on the Second Amendment many, many times over the years. In fact, mm-hmm. going back many years, I did a project uh, with the NRA and did some writing for them. So that's that's me um, in terms of my, my views. Uh, but I've only had, and it's been more recent that it's kind of come back in, but very actually limited hands-on experience, if you will, with, with guns. Right. Um, when I was very young, my father was an armored car guard. He was an armored car driver. That's what he did. Oh. So during summers, uh, during college, I would do that. That was, you know, so it's fu- kind of funny. I'm a free market economist, and I, every once in a while I'll tell people, I was a card-carrying member of the Teamsters, and they're just like, what are you <laughs> doing? <laughs> uh, but so I had a little gun training there. Mm-hmm. Um and then, really, when my, my oldest son got into Boy Scouts and just kind of doing archery and some of just the air guns and things like that, uh, just got me, you know, I was like, this target sport stuff is fascinating. I mean, I'm a golfer as well. That's what I, you know, when I have time, that's what I love to do the most. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but all of that kind of came together. And then, I'm, you know, once I'm thinking about this and, you know, playing around with the idea of James Bond as your pastor, well, then obviously you've got to get your act together, Keating, and at least do some research here. <laughs> so that's what I did, you know, and and not just the, the guns, but also Black Hawk helicopters and so on. I, I just, you know, I, I guess as a writer and a newspaper person, I just, that type of research fascinates me. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, you know, I decided on the Glock for for Stephen and actually for for the rest of his former CIA close people, um, mm-hmm. and that was just kind of looking at it and seeing what law enforcement had used in the past and so on and so on. Um, that you know that you mentioned the the Taurus PT twenty five and you know undercover gun, and I was like, well, you know what, that would make sense in terms of his background and what he mm-hmm. did before. So um, went with that and. Uh, you know, he is uh, a marksman in terms of uh, being a you know sniper and so on. So those are all things that, you know, it was just me doing research um, and, and coming up with. And what's been great, uh, I started to mention earlier, as people read these books, I hear from, you know, just very interesting individuals. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot, not on the guns exactly. I mean, on, on the gun front, you know, I get a lot of advice and, and right. input. But also just people, the, the most interesting has been, and, you know, uh, the idea that there are people out there that took the path that Stephen Grant took. I got an email once when Warrior Monk first came out, and all it said was, I am Stephen Grant. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's interesting. So I said, what does that mean? <laughs> so I struck up this email conversation with this pastor who was with the CIA. And he left the wow. CIA to become a pastor. He told me about his exit interview, and he asked them on the way out, I guess this is pretty strange for somebody to leave the CIA to become a pastor. And the person's response was interesting. He said, well, it certainly doesn't happen every day, but it's not, <laughs> it's not completely unusual because when we hire people in the first place, we want them to have a certain moral anchor. I don't know if that was the phrase that they used, but that they can you know, right. rely upon when put in various situations and so on. So that was, I thought that was kind of cool. And then I, there was a, a pastor that sent me an email and and noted that his father was in the OSS, the CIA precursor in World War II, then went on to the CIA and then, uh, you know, in the mid-50s became a pastor. So there, there, I've talked to former Army Rangers, FBI, law enforcement. It's really been fascinating to see how many people have kind of gone this path. <laughs> uh, so it's it's not completely unusual, I guess. 
Now, you even work in some some church council intrigue into the story at times, and having served, you know, you mentioned that you'd served uh, in your church. I, I was formerly president of the congregation at one of my former churches, and I found that really entertaining, some of the back and forth in the meetings, and you've got the orthodoxy lady, the, the doctrinal right, right. You know, watchdog lady. And I think every church, every church has one of every those. Every church has it? one, and then there's the there's the guy who objects to the pastor's lifestyle and his, his income, right. and and I've, that, I was like, I've seen this before. This is... <laughs> yep, so did I, so that, that made it into the book. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, people are people and that's, it's just yeah. kind of fascinating to, to see that. But there, I have discovered over the years that there are every once in a while that's like somebody fills a slot, you know what I mean? It's like that <laughs> slot has to be filled by somebody and, and that person's going to do it. <laughs> every church has the doctrinal watchdog and there's, there's right. somebody who's going to step up and fill that, that role. Having a few pastor friends of my own and, and I found this, this interesting as the, as the books go along, you know, St. Mary's holds... Um, services on uh, several services on Sunday. They've got matins twice a week. They got vespers on Wednesday, and somehow Pastor Grant <laughs> is still able to write sermons in lickety split, officiate, save the world. That's right. Where does... <laughs> <laughs> there was a co- there have been a couple of reviewers that have said it's like amazing. How does this guy do it? I'm like, well, it is it is fictional, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but yeah, no, it's. Um... Yes. And <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, that's kind of, I guess me as a parishioner, I'm like, why do we have more services? I want a midweek service. You know I mean? Right, exactly. But, uh, but, you know, part of the, the most difficult thing is like, okay, how do I get him? He's, he's still a pastor, obviously. That's, <laughs> that's what he's doing. But how do I all of a sudden get him off on this adventure? Right. Um, and with, with people believing it and saying, all right, that works for me. So I did bring in a, a you know, a assistant pastor in, in the second book. Zach Carmichael, uh, you know, a younger guy just out of seminary. Um, and that kind of helps a little bit, and, you know, in terms of some of that stuff. <laughs> right. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, you know, and, and there are times where I, I recognize that, and I have, you know, a parishioner kind of tweak him and give him a tough time, because inevitably, you know, that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's... it's uh, Having fun with it, but trying to keep it, you know, that people say, well, that's just wacky. Why would that, you know, so you can't, you can't do that. But, uh, and, and that's the thing that people would latch onto, right? They'd be like, well, he's never at his church. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes like my wife is my editor. She's the English major as they, as we like to, as I like to say. Ah. So she's been a tremendous uh, help in this um, and reining me in, in certain places and, and <laughs> things like that. But um, but you know she'll she'll remind me of, of things along those lines and and uh, you know so we keep that all kind of straight and believable. So where did you get the idea? Speaking of wives, where did you get the idea for Jennifer Breeze, who would later become Jennifer Grant? Um, she's an economist, right up your alley, and right. so and she so she's testif- and she testifies before Congress and she has she does interviews, which I, I really love because you you're you're teaching things at the same time instead of just saying, you know, passing, you know, mentioning in passing her, her testimony um, right. or her interviews, which I thought were, were great. Is there a little bit of, I would, I would, I would assume there's a little bit of you in, in Jennifer Grant? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that's, you know, that's what I do for a living. Um, so <laughs> that, you know, I've testified before Congress now, I don't know, like 24 times or something like that. And, and I do radio and television interviews all the time. Um, I got into it with Tucker Carlson recently. I'm like, wait a second, Tucker, I'm a conservative. What are you picking on me for? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, so that's what I do, you know, as the, the main gig, if you will. So that mm-hmm. was, um, you know, being able to bring in an, the character like that and have her do things like that. And, you know, that's my firsthand experience. So those things actually do happen. So, so she's Ray Keating in a dress? You know, <laughs> you know there, it, it, there's a little bit, to be honest, people have asked that. I said, well, there, there's the economist in me is, you know, Jennifer Grant. I said, there's there's certain parts of Stephen Grant that definitely are me, not the, you know, fit guy <laughs> doing all the action stuff. <laughs> and then there's Tom Stone, who's the father, uh, you know, Father Tom Stone, who's the Anglican mm-hmm. uh, priest, who's, his, his thing is... You know, he's a very traditional Christian, traditional Anglican. But when he's off duty, you know, I always point out that if, if the temperature's over 60 degrees, he has shorts and a Hawaiian shirt on. And he's got a very good sense of humor and so on. And that, that, that's part me, you know, and my wife tries to make me not wear Hawaiian shirts. So. <laughs> 
but that so you know there's a mix there in terms of you know where I kind of wind up little slivers of me throughout the book. Right. I love that character and I love his his interactions with with the Catholic priest and they're picking at each other back and forth over over meals or at the golf course. Right. And so, right. So Father McDermott, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, and they're so they're very they seem to be opposites. And I make that point, you know, because they're Tom Stone is very easygoing, you know, quick laugh. And then, you know, Father McDermott's kind of more, he comes across, especially initially, very kind of stern and by the book <laughs> and so on. But, um, and they do that. They're, 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 their personalities, you think they clash, but they don't. This is just, you know, kind of a guy thing, if you will. I was one of, you know, it's funny, I mentioned my wife's the main editor. Um, I had to convince her of some of those things, you know, as much as she's been married to me for almost 30 years and we have two boys, I still had to convince her, no, this is how guys actually talk. It's okay. <laughs> this is perfectly so, normal. <laughs> right. This is what we do when women aren't around. <laughs> if we're not making fun of each other, we don't like each other. It's right. Just... <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. Now you've got lots of positive reviews of the books, but naturally there are some, shall we say, liberal Lutherans who don't think a whole lot of Pastor Stephen Grant's adventures or his positions on certain issues. Um, particularly, I ran across this review from, I think it was Luther Seminary, which is the ELCA, of course, and 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 he's complaining that it's it sounds like it could have been written by the NRA and you know <laughs> yeah i know the review you're talking about it's, and it's quite a lengthy review i mean that guy put really a lot is. of time into that he, <laughs> it's like my did. goodness um, and there's actually one paragraph in that review where i know he didn't mean it this way but it's like I, i'm going to pull that paragraph out someday <laughs> And like use it because quite frankly that paragraph is just like marvelous. He does this description, and I know he doesn't mean it in a way, but he writes it in kind of a, you know, a, a somewhat amusing way. Where if you just read that paragraph, you'd think like, oh, well, I'm going to pick up those books. <laughs> exactly. Well, th there was this, <clears throat> and I was I, I actually pulled out one of these one of his quotes because I wanted to get your your thoughts on this because it sounds like something that Pastor Bennett and I would go and just tear to pieces in our Clinging to God and Gun segment. But it's, he says, uh, what are we to make of, of the hero, Pastor Stephen Grant, the author's image of the perfect pastor? First of all, he's a firm believer in the lex talionis, and I didn't look that up, and it's Latin for something, uh, <laughs> law of something. Bad guys should get what they deserve 10 times over, and we good guys get to meet it out no matter what Jesus says about retaliation. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> yeah it's you know listen there <laughs> i always tell people you know in my little when i have my little you know when we have a discussion at church or something uh, you know not me telling people but I, you know what i kind of bring up is you know jesus will forgive us for yeah anything you know if we go to him and say you know th 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 and it's mind blowing actually when you think about it, you know what i mean when you really start to think about that you're like oh my goodness anything <laughs> but yes and yeah. but it doesn't wipe out the consequences on this earth. It doesn't mean that, you know, everything, then the consequences of your actions here and now just go away. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you confess your sins, which is wonderful. And if you do it in prison, when you're in a, you know, a triple life sentence, that doesn't mean your triple life sentence gets to go away. So, you know, um, just the eternal one. Right. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. And, you know, and, uh, and the Lord, you know, gave government the power of the sword. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. um, so you can't, you know, that, but that's kind of classic kind of, you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> to what you, what I would expect, but there was, you know, so it is what it is, but I still love the one paragraph where I, someday I'm going to pull it out and just slap it on something. It'll probably drive them crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> So what, as a Lutheran, as an LCMS Lutheran, give us kind of your view on on gun rights and how they fit into a Christian worldview. I mean, we've talked about this on our on the podcast quite a bit, but you know, how does that? Uh, what is your your view on this and 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 um, your your thoughts on gun rights from a Christian perspective? Sure. Well. Um... I don't know if I've actually ever been asked that the question that way before, but awesome. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the bottom line is, you know, anything, you know, a gun, there's that old joke where it's like, 
you hear this a lot lately. Well, you know, gun violence took, you know, right. people died as a result of gun violence. Like, you know, and the, the old joke is like the gun got up and, you know, <laughs> did all these horrible things without any humans attached. So, you know, a gun is a tool, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it could be used for hunting and for sport, and it could be used to protect your family and your friends and so on, and it can be used for evil. So that's that's how I come at it. It's it's um, that's number one. Um, mm-hmm. After that, and and to understand, I think see it's critical, and I think Lutherans get it on human nature better than most other people and most other Christians, right? right? I agree. The, the sinful nature of, of, of sinful aspects of human nature. So that means, you know, quite frankly, you're, you're being, if, you would be irresponsible in a sense that, you know, if you put yourself in danger and not have some sort of protection. Mm-hmm. So you have to just understand human nature for what it is. And, you know, it's not, this isn't, this world is not perfect. It's fallen. Um, so the idea that you, uh, people choose to arm themselves for self-defense, and they are law-abiding individuals. Why should that be a problem for anybody? Quite frankly, right. um, and I think I, I don't think in any way, shape, or form that contradicts scripture in, in terms of what I've been taught. Um, uh, you know, there's the you know the point about you know Jesus didn't tell the centurion right to stop being a soldier and so on. So, you know, it, it's mm-hmm. to me it's it's really a stretch to. But it's, you know, people are doing it <laughs> um, right. to say that somehow or another uh, a Christian can't support uh, or shouldn't support the Second Amendment. I just mm-hmm. – I, I think it's a, it's a naive view of – it's not only a naive view of human nature, but it's it's just dead wrong if you understand Holy Scripture and what – you know, who we are, saints and sinners, and why we need Jesus in the end, exactly. right? Exactly. So. Yep. So what is next for Pastor Stephen Grant? Now you got the, we talked a little bit earlier about Lionheart's coming out. When is the book coming out, and and can you give us kind of a a little brief flavor of what what the the story is about in Lionheart's? Sure, it's uh, barring, and I keep you know in life I always have to put the you know barring anything blowing up in my face with this stuff. Uh, <laughs> it should be out this month. Now I can't tell you exactly when. Fantastic. But it should be out uh, this month. And the, the idea is that, as we, I put on the back of the book, it's war and terrorism on American soil. There are new tactics um, that that we really haven't seen before, but mm-hmm. that line up with the history of, um, if you want to say, Islamic radicalism. Right. Um, um, and, and things are, you know, I, I don't want to, this is very much a, you know, we've seen in the Middle East, uh, Islamic attacks on Christians. Mm-hmm. And it's been horrible and horrifying. And I kind of take that and say, okay, what happens? I mean, we've had our attacks here, obviously, but what happens if you have a concerted effort right. along those lines in this country? Ray Keating is an economist and author of the Pastor Stephen Grant novels available at pastorstephengrant.com, or you can find them at amazon.com. I'll have links to all of them in the show notes. Um, Ray, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoy it. Oh, Lloyd, this has been great fun. I appreciate it. As many of you know, you'll likely have to win two fights if you have to use your gun in self-defense. The first fight is the gunfight itself. The second is the fight to clear your good name through the legal system. Even if you do everything right, you can still be prosecuted, which can cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Armed Lutheran Radio is proud to partner with the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. And while they can't completely take away that worry, they can give you the peace of mind knowing that you've got the financial and legal assistance you need to win this new fight. Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network can help. Go to my website, armedlutheranradio.us, look for the coupon code on the right-hand side in the sidebar, and sign up for Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network protection and save $25 off your first year of membership at armedcitizensnetwork.org. Join me, Pastor Bennett, Paul Lathrop, and thousands of American gun owners who trust Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network, armedcitizensnetwork.org. RG. It's time for this week's self-defense tip from Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense. Hey folks, this is Aaron Israel with Fundamental Defense here with your personal defense tip of the week. This week I want to give you a tip that I found on my Facebook page, showed up in my news feed, one of my friends shared it, 
It's from a guy named Bert Folks, B-E-R-T-F-U-L-K-S. His website is BertFolks.com, and he's come up with an interesting way to give his kids a way out of tough situations that they might find themselves in when they're over at a friend's house or out with uh, a group of kids or whatever, and things uh, start to go in a direction that they're not comfortable with. And that could be drugs, alcohol, sex-related, who knows what the situation is, but a situation where kids want to get out of it but don't really have a way out, and this is this dad's attempt at giving his kids way out. He calls it the X plan. And basically what it is, is that if any of his kids find themselves in an untenable situation that they want to get out of, all they do is text message the mom or the dad, just X. They get an X as the text message. And then the mom or the dad knows when they get that message that within five minutes, they're supposed to call the kid and say, Hey, look, something's come up at the house and we need you to come home immediately. I can't go into a lot of detail right now, but you need to come home right now. And then that gives the kid the out to say, hey, my dad or my mom just called me and said something's gone, happened at the house, and I need to get home as soon as I can. And then they go and pick the kid up and get them out of that situation. So that gives gives the kid a, a legitimate excuse to get out of the situation that's not going to make them sound lame, is not going to make it sound too made up, because, hey, when your parents say you got to go, you got to go, right? So that's the X plan. Now, the factor that makes this work, though, is that once they go pick up the kid, it's the kid's option whether or not they're going to tell them exactly what they were getting themselves into. Now, that might sound like a dishonesty thing to you. Maybe you think it encourages your kids to lie, but I actually think it's a great idea because you want that kid to talk about it on their own terms. You don't want them to think that, hey, if I use the X plan, I'm going to get chewed out when mom or dad comes to get me and they're going to give me a lecture about how I shouldn't be around drugs or alcohol and I need to pick better friends or whatever. They don't have that pressure uh, and they're not going to be likely to, to skip out on the X plan because they don't want to get chewed out. So giving them that out and letting them talk about it on their own terms and that they can bring it up and they can discuss it if they want to is, I think, a good plan. So if you have teenagers or kids that are starting to go out and hang out with friends and you're giving them a little bit more rope as they get a little bit older, this gives them a way to uh, get out of bad situations and gives you that peace of mind that you can keep an open line of communication with your kids when things go south and they get into situations that are untenable for them. So check out the X plan at BertFolks.com and that's your personal defense tip of the week. Thanks for tuning in. Aaron Israel is a personal defense network contributor and owner of Fundamental Defense. You can find out more and sign up for any of Aaron's classes at FundamentalDefense.com. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. Thank you to our special guest, Ray Keating, for joining us on today's show. I I sure hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. I really appreciate him taking the time to be on the show with us this week. Thank you also to our contributors, uh, Aaron Israel, Mia Anstein, who is traveling and should be back with us next week. Pastor John Bennett will also be back with us next week for another episode of Clinging to God and Guns. And, of course, Sergeant Bill Sylvia, he's on vacation this weekend with his family. We'll uh, look forward to a tip from him next week as well. And thank you all for listening, downloading, and subscribing. I hope you'll join us again next week. Until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and tune in. This podcast is made possible by Cook's Holsters and contributions from listeners like you.